Hello and a warm welcome along to the Racing Postcast brought to you by Racing Post Members Club. Those of you who are listening on audio platforms, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, welcome along as always. But for those of you who are seeing our faces for the first time, welcome along. Yeah, we're on YouTube now for a big weekend of racing. This is now a permanent thing with us being on YouTube. We're going to have a, a weekly uh, weekend preview every Thursday at half past six. It's now a dedicated time, and we've moved the show to a Thursday. So every Thursday, half six, the postcast will be released, giving you more time to listen in and find out who we fancy for the big weekend action. As always, I'm joined by two of my Racing Post colleagues, and I'm joined alongside Graham Robway and David Jennings. DJ, I'll start with you. A massive weekend for Irish sport this weekend. You've got France taking on Ireland in the football this evening. You've got Ireland kicking off their Rugby World Cup campaign at the weekend against Romania. You've got the Irish Open happening in the Gulf and obviously the big one, Irish Champions weekend at Leopardstown and the Curra. Really looking forward to it. Yeah, when you started there, I thought you were going to say a massive head is on my screen at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just when podcast listeners thought the podcast couldn't get any worse and me and G-Rod together couldn't get any more brutal. Now they have to look at us as well. Although I have to say, I am very impressed with G-Rod. Look at that man. That is a different man to what was usually behind the screen when we couldn't see him. He looks very groomed today, I have to say. He's very sharp, isn't he? G-Rod, welcome along. How do you get these sharp looks? Very rare for anyone to, to tell me that I'm looking sharp. So, uh, DJ, uh, we, we have to do this every week. You know, boosting my ego. Yeah, I think that tan is from a bottle. <laughs> Are you looking well, forward to the action, looking forward to the action this weekend, G Rod? Very much looking forward to it, Sam. It's a great action, isn't it, across both sides of the Irish Sea, and like you say, a great sporting weekend as well, isn't it? Surely Ireland are going to win the Rugby World Cup, DJ, aren't they? This is their big year. This is their yeah. year, the gold generation. Absolutely, right, number one in the world. Uh, I don't know if you've seen our record in World Cups. I think nine of the last ten World Cups we've gone out at the quarter-final stage, which is quite remarkable to go out at the same stage every every year that the World Cup is held. I think there's only one year we didn't make it out of the group stage, but this is the year, Johnny Sexton's last World Cup. Yeah, fingers crossed, G-Rod. Like Messi, isn't it? You know, his last <laughs> World Cup. Johnny Sexton's last World Cup. There we go. He's, he's our Messi. Like I say, a massive weekend for Irish sport um, coming up, but we're going to be delving into all the big racing we've got action from Leopardstown like I say on Saturday the car on Sunday and we'll also be heading to Haydock on Saturday for the big group one there the sprint cut but we kick things off at Leopardstown with the 215 there which is the one mile KPMG champions at juvenile stakes to group two for the two-year-olds where Diego Velasquez is the 7-4 on favourite Atlantic Coast 5-1 Capulet is 15 to Depone is 14 to 1. Formal display is 22 to 1. 25 to 1 and bigger about the other three in here. DJ, I will start with you here. Diego Velasquez, a, a son of Franco, out of a, I think it's an applic uh, applic uh, acclamation there, is it? I think the, the damn so I'm, I'm quite excited by this horse in terms of moving forward. Surely just wins this. Yeah, I think so. You kind of want to be starting the brand new look po uh, postcast with like this big claim, maybe that like a 20 to 1 outsider is going to win or something. But uh, look, uh, I think Aidan O'Brien has four exceptional juveniles this year. And probably to rank them in order, I'd say you'd probably go City of Troy, probably uh, number one, I'd imagine. Henry Longfellow, two. Diego Velasquez, maybe three, and, and River Tiber, who evidently was himself in France, probably number four. And then there's that kind of a second tier who are very good below them. But Diego Velasquez, yeah, I think he's a three-part brother to Broom and Point Lonsdale. Um, I think the key thing, he won by four and three-quarter lengths, I think, at, at, uh, at the current when he won his maiden. He was two to five to win that maiden. Now, I know he's trained by Aidan O'Brien, and usually they do start in a round favourite and you get a few short, but it takes a lot for an Aidan O'Brien runner to start two to five on his first start, knowing how much they usually improve from first to second start. There was 13 runners in that maiden as well. Um, and I spoke to Aidan O'Brien earlier this week just to try and finalise his team. for. I think I spoke to him on Tuesday to try and finalise his team for the weekend. And the one thing he kept saying about Diego Velasquez was just how green he was in debut. He said he was really green, and we're hoping the run will improve him a lot. Um, he doesn't need to improve a great deal on that run to win this. I'd say he's very much a 2024 Epsom Derby candidate. Uh, I think he'll win. There's a, there's a lot of unknown quantities in the field. 
you're probably guessing to see how good Diego Velasquez is, but I think he's very good. The one horse who I do think will outrun his odds is Deep One. I don't think the tight track at Tipperary really suited him. He never really looked in his comfort zone. And Warnie's a good horse around the Chesham. Uh, first time out for Joseph O'Brien, but I think Diego Velasquez will win. He's probably won for your multiples, but if you're looking for something at a, at a bigger price, maybe without the favour of each way, uh, I'd be reasonably interested in Deep One. Deep One that is uh, an interesting candidate, 14 20 each way, but Diego Velasquez looks the most likely winner. Giro, 2.4 million guineas as a yearling, surely just wins this, doesn't he? Uh, yeah, it looks that way, don't it? Um, um, I find this quite a difficult race to get involved with from a punting perspective because we don't know really how good Diego Velasquez is, do we? We just know that Aidan O'Brien obviously thinks that he's pretty good because he went off very short first time out and Aidan said, I think, after the race that he could have ran in wherever he wanted, he felt, which I thought was almost telling that he thought that he'd probably win wherever he went. Um, And uh, he's obviously got a massive chance. He's top on RPRs after just that one run. It's hard to oppose him, isn't it? But there's any number of unknown quantities in there against him and he's a very short price so i think he'll win but it's not really a betting race for me sam yeah not a race to get too excited over in terms of betting prospect but definitely one for future prospects with diego velasquez uh, a, a classic candidate for next season as a three-year-old let's move on then to the 245 at leopardstown which is the Cornwall america justified matron stakes this is one mile Group one for the Phillies and Mares, where Tahira is back in action. Uh, 11 to 10 on favourite. Homeless Songs is 10 to 1. Meditate 10 to 1. Zarinsk is 10 to 1. Just Beautiful 12 to 1. 16 to 1 about the other ones in here. G-Rod, Tahira, um, obviously very, very impressive in the Irish 1,000 guineas and very impressive at Ascot. Had a little bit of a break. Dermot World did say they're going to have a, an awesome campaign with this horse. And again, another short price favourite on the postcast, but a, a likely winner. Yeah, she should win, shouldn't she, Sam? She 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 looked very good. I mean, the only horse to beat her was what Morge, wasn't it? In the in the Guineas, and uh, yeah, it, it's it's another one, isn't it? She's very very hard to knock. The, the one thing I suppose you would have in in the back of your mind is, like you say, she's coming off the back of a break, and and, and no doubt has probably got bigger targets uh, ahead of her. I would have thought so. Quite how fit she will be from returning from what seventy eight days off the track is the main question mark but then you're being asked to weigh that up against the price aren't you i mean if she was coming in hard fit she'd probably be a bit shorter than she is now and again uh, it's pretty boring isn't it sam but i think she'll probably win um and obviously a stable mate is the main danger isn't it isn't she as uh, homeless songs but she hasn't looked the same filly that we saw when she won the or one of those group ones in ireland last year she's never really reproduced that form has she no, she hasn't, but like you say to hear a Dermot World Tour, she's a, a bit of a star. She's She could even put herself down as one of the best milers we've seen all year. Could still be the best miler we've seen all year. DJ, what do you make of Tahira? She's obviously exceptional, and you'd like to think she can end the season really strongly. I hope so, yeah. I hope she wins. Uh, I interviewed Chris Hayes for a feature that's in Friday's Race and Post, and uh, he, like the way he just speaks about her, but there's two things I took from it. One... He did say to here is the best he sat on, but he said, I interviewed him last week and uh, at this stage we didn't know whether both to here and homeless songs were going to run against each other. And he was, he was very sweet and homeless songs, like much sweeter than I thought he'd be. He was kind of like, when she's on her game, she is seriously top class. And he was like, if they run against each other, I wouldn't like to pick between them. And I let the boss choose for me. Obviously he's on to here with the odds on favors. But officially, Homeless Songs is rated one pound above Tahira, which is hard to believe. Um, now, obviously, Homeless Songs as a four-year-old has to give Tahira five pound, so there's a four pound swing there. But um, yeah, it is interesting. I, w- I was surprised at how sweet he was in Homeless Songs. Uh, she goes well fresh. Um, I thought it was a good run behind Buckaroo on her return to action, and I think she could run well. But Tahira is just, you know, she's just oozes class every bit of her uh, I don't think she does a whole lot when she hits the front so I wouldn't worry too much about the winning distance in the Irish Guineas and the uh, and the Coronation Stakes at Ascot uh, one at a bigger price uh, in the previous race I said deep one I think will run well one at a big price here that I think will definitely run well is just beautiful for Paddy, Paddy Toomey and uh, Billy Lee Paddy won this race last year with a big price winner um, and I think with just beautiful ground, ground, ground she just has to have rattling quick ground 
It's been absolutely scorching here all week. I don't quite have the same tan as as Girod, who looks like he's been living in Brazil for the last year. I think that's the grey hair that's doing that. It's uh, emphasising the tan. But uh, uh, he has been so patient with Just Beautiful. She's had so many targets all year. Paddy Toomey said, no, we're not going. We need good ground. No, we're not going. She rocks up here. He won the race last year. She is very good. She's not Tahira, and she's probably not Homeless Songs, but she's extremely good. I think she's she's probably the each way play, each way, I'd say, just beautiful. But fingers crossed, I hope Tahira wins. Yeah, just beautiful. Currently 12-1 to on each way play, but I think we're all in the camp that Tahira should be too good and win the matron stakes. Let's move on then to what what is, in my opinion, the race of the weekend, the 320 at Leopardstown, which is the 10 furlong Royal Bahrain Irish Champion Stakes. Again, this is a Group 1 where King of Steel tops the market of 3-1. to one. August Rodan looking to come back to form after that disappointment in the King George at Ascot, 7-2. to Alflayla supplemented for the race for the Iron Burrows team, 6-1. to one. Nashua, she keeps going this season, 15-2. to Ernesto, the French Raider, is 8-1. to one. Al Riffa, for the Joe's Foe Brian Yard, 9 to 1, 11 to 1 about Luxembourg, and 50 to 1, and 100 to 1 about Spreewell and Point Lonsdale. This is a hell of a race, it really is, DJ. What have you made of this? Oh, um, well, I always judge how strongly I fancy a horse in a race by how much I fancy the horses they are running against, if that makes any sort of sense, right? So, Point Lonsdale won't win, and Spreewell won't win. But the problem is, any of the other seven could win. They really could. Any of the other seven, like if you go through it, King of Steel was 13 to 8 earlier on the week. That was a ridiculous price, but like he's a cracking three year old. Cup, 10 Furlands could be his best trip. He could win. He could be very, very good. Augusta, then, as I said in, in a piece I'm writing for Saturday, you could describe his season as hot and cold, but more apt would be it's been boiling or freezing. Like he's either brilliant or brutal. So Aidan O'Brien seems to be making all the right vibes going into this race, so you're probably going to get brilliant. Um, can you trust him? No. If he won, would you be surprised? Absolutely not. Um, Al Falela, I love. I thought he was valued for far more than the winning margin at York. I love the way, he, despite how keen he was, that he was still able to quicken and put a few, pull a few lengths clear before the runner-up closed at York. He is very much in my thinking. Um, Price-wise, he's in my top two. Uh, Nashua... She's just a cracking filly, isn't she, that seems to turn up most days and she'll run her race. Would you be shocked if she won? Absolutely not. Onesto, on his best form, has a massive chance. Al Riffa, to me, is a big, big player to get so close to ace impact. When I didn't think he really got the run of the race, didn't really get that much space to manoeuvre up the home straight, never thought Christoph could really let him unwind. Uh, so I think Al Riff is a big player. Look, Luxembourg is Luxembourg. He could do anything. I don't think he's quite good enough at this stage of his career. So... To, to sum up, basically, at the prices, I've narrowed it down to two, Al Riffa and Al Falela, despite the fact that five of the others could win. Um, the reason I'm opting for Al Riffa is the best price, 9-1, to one, which I think is a bit of value, is I think he's he's gradually getting there. Won the National Stakes last year. If you are in Leprosau tomorrow, go down to the Prairie Ring, have a look at Al Riffa. He's a monster. He is massive. And I think everything, when he had that setback before the Irish 2000 Guineas, everything has been geared towards the autumn. And I just think that step up from first start back when Monsieur got first run to the run against Ace Impact to here, I just think he's he's ready to peak. Whereas some of the rest of them, Augusto Rodin, King of Steel, Nashua, I just wonder have they peaked already this season. So I think Al Riffa is the one that's probably just ready to peak and could produce a performance right out of the top drawer. Love Al Flayla. Um, I have it between those two just because of price, really, and just how envisioning the race going. But, uh, sure, look, any of, the other, any of the other five that I mentioned there could win. But I'll riff it just ahead of Alpha Leila for me, yeah, Sam. But I could change my mind come Saturday. Yeah, I mean, looking at our if I was quite a fan, and the price is a, a fairly big one at 9-1. to one. They've, they've got Christoph Sumi on booked, DJ. Obviously, Dylan Brown McMonagall has ridden the horse, I think, every time prior to that run in France. Do you think the reason for Christoph Sumi on taking the ride was due to how good a run that was out in France? I don't know. Um, Dylan Brown McMonagall is the closest thing we have coming through. He's the next Colin yeah, Keane. He's, he is. you know, he's the one you talk to any trainer. They want Dylan Brown yeah. McMonagall every day of the week. So, it's look, it's a big call, and I know they're giving him the consolation prize by legging him up on Point Lonsdale. But um, yeah, look, he's not Christoph Subian yet, and you have to deal with the now when you're involved in in these classic generation horses. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a bit harsh, I think. But look, Christoph is Christoph. 
yeah, it, it is what it is. And, and like you say, look, this horse could go very close. I think this. I can't for... wait to see what G Rod has to say. Yeah, I know. Like, like, G Rod that... could actually tip anything, and that includes Point Lonsdale. That includes Freewell. G Rod could come out with anything, and I just pray that he's a strong fancy. Who knows? Point Lonsdale could go loose on the front end, and G Rod might think a hundred to one's a big price, but. Uh, look, Giro, like I say, it's a cracking race. You've got so many different angles into this race, and DJ's been through probably about seven of them there. Who do you fancy? Uh, I fancy Nashua. Yeah, I think that she she's a great bet in this race. She's the best horse in the race um, on, on RPRs, certainly on recent RPRs. Um, she was given 122 when she won at Newmarket by a, a long way, didn't she, in the Falmouth. And then last time the put her back on 122 when she was beaten by Mossadegh, finishing second. When you include a, a £3 fillies allowance, um, those are the two best pieces of form available in this race, according to RPRs. And those are two of Nashua's last three starts, including over the trip. So how she can be 15 to 2, 7 to 1 uh, in this field uh, defies belief, really. Uh, the other horse that I thought would run well was last year. Last year's winner, wasn't it? Luxembourg. Did he win this race mm, last yeah, year? Yeah, he did. Yeah, he beat Ernesto, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. He I could see. Uh, I could definitely see Luxembourg running really well again back at this track. Again, he's got some really solid form this season. I don't think he was he was disgraced at all when he was beaten by Mostadaf at Ascot. Let's not forget in that race at, at Royal Ascot, they they went really hard up front. Um, the the, the first two, didn't they? Yeah, Luxembourg, and I can't remember the other one that was up there hassling him for the league. I think they kind of set it up for Mostadaf, but Mostadaf since shown that that form is pretty good. Um, and I think Luxembourg might have given Mostadaf more to think about if, if he hadn't have been uh, gone off so quickly in front. Uh, I, I, I think there, there are two cracking bets in this race, Nashua uh, and Luxembourg. I'm dead keen to be against the three-year-olds. I don't think they're they're very good. We were obviously massively disappointed, wasn't he? Old August Rodan. I don't know what happened to him last time. Um, uh, there was an excuse, wasn't there? But um, King of Steel is a, is a decent horse, but he doesn't strike me as a as a proper Group One horse. I, I don't think he'll go a favourite for this race. Uh, he's a he's a proper Group One horse. That's rubbish. What King of Steel? It's a proper Group like, Group One horse. Yeah, of course, D- he's a Group D- One D- horse. He's rated 121. <sighs> No. Uh, Gerard, you said this about Power Driver. You, you called him a Group One and a Half horse. Is is that how you see King of Steel? I don't think King of Steel will win a Group One in his career. Wow. But you're, that's fair enough. Like, but I don't know. Like, who knows if he'll race on again next season? But like, on his day, he is a Group One horse. He is a very, very good horse. And like, what, what is it? Okay, so hold on a second here, Gerard. Right, just to sum up here, okay. So you're saying he's not a pr- proper Group 1 horse, okay? He's produced, and you're quoting Racing Post ratings here for Nashua, okay? He's produced on his last three starts a Racing Post rating of 122, a Racing Post rating of 120, and a Racing Post rating of 123 in the King George, okay? If, a, if three runs in a row in the 120s is not a proper Group 1 horse, what the hell is? So that is all behind Nashua, Auguste Rodin, Luxembourg, yeah, they've they they've all won Group Ones, haven't they? Uh, how many Group Ones has King of Steel won? None. So, how many proper Group One horses are there in training at the moment? Like three. Well, I think you, to be considered a proper Group One horse, you have to have at least won one, DJ, don't you? Yeah, but she's only ran in three. What King of Steel? He's only ran in three Group Ones, yeah. Yeah, well, he didn't won one yet. Has he, he ran in the Racing Post Trophy on heavy ground. He was just beaten in the Derby when he ran a cracker in the pub clear of the third. And then he was third after being keen in the King George. Of course he's a proper Group 1 horse. Well, I'll quote you that back when he finishes his career as a Group 1 and a half horse. Well, there we go. We're, we'll have to wait and see. But both the gentlemen are taking on the, the top two in the market. King of Steel and August Rodan. DJ with Al Flayla and Al Riff. Al Riffa being his main selection. And G-Rod being with Luxembourg and Nashua being his strong selection in the Irish Champion Stakes. Let's move on to the 355 then, which is the one mile Dullingham Park Stakes. This is a group two um, where Victoria Road is the three to one favourite. Buckaroo 100 to 30. Bold Discovery is 8 to 1. Lord Masseuses is 10 to 1. I think I've said that right. Alfred Munnings is 12 to 1. 16 to 1 and bigger about the rest of them in here. 
Uh, G-Rod, back to you now. Victoria Road was seventh on reappearance out in France in uh, a race won by Ace Impact. We've already mentioned the race. I think it was the pre guillaume Donano, I think is the pronunciation of the race. But it was won by Ace Impact. So Al Riffle was second. Victoria Road was coming back after a long break. Obviously, he was exceptional as a two-year-old, especially towards the end of his two-year-old campaign. Would that run have got him fit enough to win this? Uh, well, you'd, you'd hope that, that, that he'd be good enough uh, to win this one, wouldn't you, um, Sam? But uh, you do have to question, like, when you've only seen him once and he was so good at two and then, you know, he's, he was not beaten far by Ace Impact, but he did only beat one home, didn't he? So he's going to have to take a giant leap forward, isn't he, to win this uh, from that run um, at uh, Deauville first time. So I couldn't have him on my mind as, as favourite. Um is that I think the, the DJ probably know, but um, isn't this the course where Buckaroo ran like a, one of his best performances? Uh, just sticks in my mind. Yeah, it was the uh, last. Uh, he's he's run two good races at this track, hasn't he? Anyway, he beat Homeless Songs in one of them, and I think as a three-year-old, didn't he go close in the? Was it the Derringstown or one of those? No, races? he was he was just beaten in the Valley Sacks by Pisbody. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so I, just, I don't know. I just I, I don't have a strong opinion on the race. I've not really looked at it that closely, as you can probably tell by by my sort of half-hearted analysis of it. But just looking at Buckaroo, I know this is his track, and uh, if I was going to play, I would play him. But it's not a race that I'll be betting in, Sam. Okay, Buckaroo, Oshin Murphy aboard that one. Uh, DJ. Like I said about Victoria Road, I find it fascinating because I was quite excited to see Victoria Road at the start of the season. I remember messaging you probably back in May time, asking you questions about Victoria Road. We haven't seen him for majority of the season. Obviously, a big autumn campaign expected for Victoria Road. Dropping back to the, the mile probably is going to suit this horse. And if back to probably the form of a, as he's shown it to, he, he probably should be winning this, no? No, I don't fancy him. I fancy Buckaroo. Really? Uh, yeah, I fancy Buckaroo. I think he's one of the best bets on the Leopardstown card. Probably the best bet of the day at Leopardstown. Um, just with Buckaroo, I think I think he's probably a mile... I think he's a nine furlong horse, but I think in a strongly run mile, he's really, really good. Uh, I don't think he quite... I don't think he quite see out ten. Um, he did run on reasonably well in the Wolford Tunnel at Royal Ascot. Like you'd imagine, that race was there for him. He was rated 112. He was still beating two lengths by Royal Champion. He was a bit disappointing, but I just, I think G Rod makes a valid point. I think Leperson could be his track, and I think a strongly run Royal at, mile at Leperson is exactly what he needs. Look, he traded really short in the Bally Sacks last year, and um, he was only headed close home by Piz Badil, and then he beat Homeless Songs, and I'd say he beat. Uh, a fairly, excuse the pun, on song, Homeless Songs, I'd imagine, in, on, on his reappearance. They pulled nicely clear of uh, Mia Domina in third that day. Uh, he showed a real good attitude to fight back. Homeless Songs traded really short and running. Um, I'd say he's had a break after Ascot, and a bit like Tahira, really. He's had a break after Ascot. Champion stakes is the plan. I'd say Joseph O'Brien knows deep down he's not a genuine Group 1 horse, but there's Group 2s there to be mopped up. This is one of them. Uh, Stall one. Oshie Murphy will just sit maybe second or third on the inside. He can make it if he needs to. But uh, I think Buckaroo will win. Okay, Buckaroo won the strongest bets on the Leopardstown card, according to DJ, um, in the 3.55. Let's move on to the final race we're going to be previewing from Leopardstown, which is the 4.30, which is the one and a half mile Paddy Power Stakes, which is a group three. And Adelaide River is the 7-4 to favourite here. Al Arce is 130. White Birch is 5-1. to one. Valiant King is 15 to 2, 12 to 1 about Lafayette. Mashaw is 16 to 1, and Young Island 40 to 1 in here. Adelaide River DJ, I, I was actually a massive fan this horse. As soon as he finished second, a lot of questions were asked about the, the ride in the Irish Derby, but then went out to France and finished second in the, the Grand Prix de Paris um, behind what I think might actually end up being the, the Prix de l'Arc de Triomphe winner in Feed the Flame, who we also see this weekend. I think that was a strong race. I think he's probably, in my opinion, the best bet on the, the card uh, at Leopardstown, but I don't know what your opinion is. Yeah, yeah, he's got a chance. Um, just some win, though, Sam, does he? Like, he just, I know yeah, he's holding the, the highest company, but, like, you look at them form figures, there's a lot of twos next to his name. Uh, you know, the Derby, the Irish Derby was certainly uh, an interesting race to watch, let's say. Mm. Um Look, he, he definitely has a chance. Look, he's getting weighed from Al-Azi. I think he's getting £11, which, which is a 
fair chunk of weight to be getting um, this time of year. He's got a chance. Um, I don't have a massively strong opinion on this race. I think Al Azi, for all the names we call him, he's won a lot of races. Like he's won an awful lot of races for all the names he's been called. He's just such a strong traveler. And this is one of the points I've made time and time again on the postcast and different areas. Like we we crucify these horses that are strong travelers and call them rogues. And yet horses who need to, you know, have the kitchen sink thrown at them are heroes, where it's really it's actually the other way around because the horses that are on the bridle are giving you everything on the bridle and don't need any encouragement. Whereas the other way around, you need to be kind of, um, you know, fooled along. Uh, I think Al Azi is a good horse. I think he's got every chance of winning this race. It's going to be hard to give Adelaide River all the way. At the prices at the moment, I think this market is yet to really form. At the prices at the moment, I'd, I'd be very, very surprised if Valiant King went off as big as he is at the moment. He's 15 to 2. I think he's entered in the Melbourne Cup. Like, he brings some really rock-solid form into the race. That second of Vauban uh, at Nace was a really good run. Vauban is playing for the Melbourne Cup. Second of Desert Hero at Ascot. Like, that run against Desert Hero is looking better and better by the moment than the King George V. Um, you know, there were some good horses behind them that day. I think, at the moment, Valley and King... al he is what he is. He could win. But I think, at the moment, at the prices, I'd be with Valley and King. Okay, Valiant King, 15 to 2. Yeah, a fairly big price there. Murphy taking the ride. G Rod, Alazi's a horse that I think we've, we've thrown so many questions at in his last two runs, but he's done it so easily and so comfortably under Jim Crowley. What did you make of this one? Yeah, he's um, he's back on track, isn't he, Alazi? I mean, at the start of the season, he started terribly, didn't he? He was um, beating 20 odd lengths in that race behind Kamari, and then suddenly he showed up at Haydock and he ran against that Phantom Flight, who I thought was a good bet that day, and ran all over him, sadly, for my. From my pocket's perspective, and then uh, yeah, won nicely last time, didn't he? But he has obviously got to carry a penalty here, hasn't he? Because he's a uh, Group Three winner lined up in a Group Three, um, and uh, because Adelaide River is such a, a professional loser, he, he doesn't have any penalty, does he? But um, I think he will get his head in front here, Adelaide River. Um, his form just looks looks at least as good as our ours is, and he's getting the weight. He's improving, isn't he? According to his profile, his last two runs have been his best, and they'll be absolutely desperate to get his head back in front, won't they? Um, get him a win. I think Ryan Moore will keep this fairly simple. We'll have him in the first two or three. It's not a huge field, is it? And provided he he can come out, I suspect Mashur will make the running, and uh, he'll probably mow that one down towards the finish. I'll be surprised if Alars he can give him weight. Okay, yeah, I, I, like I say, I think Adelaide River is a, a good bet. As much as DJ says, look, he doesn't get his head in front enough. I think he's finished second in his last two starts behind two very good horses in August Rodan and obviously Feed the Flame, who who runs on Sunday at Longchamp. So, yeah, look, Adelaide River currently 7-4. to I don't think that's the worst bet in the world. Let's take a trip to Haydock then for the one race we're going to be covering, the 335, which is the six furlong Betfair Sprint Cup Stakes. Another Group 1 here, part of the British Champion Series. And Shaquille tops the market at 10-11. to Millstream Spycatcher 11-1. to Sacred 12-1. to St. Lawrence is 14-1. to Lazoo and Regional 16-1. to 20-1. to and bigger about the rest of them in here. James Dahl retakes the ride on Shaquille. Obviously, he hasn't been on the last twice due to other commitments, G-Rod. He has mentioned in the racing post, I've seen the, the quotes today, where he said the start is key. But on the last two starts, it hasn't really been that key. He's blown the start and still done the job in good style. So how good could this horse potentially be? Oh, yeah, he's absolutely outstanding, isn't he? If he can come out the stalls on terms, he, he's going to win, surely. Um, he has just been so, so good, despite making a complete horlix of the start on his last two runs. Uh, and he just carted Ross Orion through in the um, in the July Cup, didn't he? It was just incredible, incredible the way that he, he carted through the field, went to the front and was just in a completely different class to the rest of them. Um, the the worry, if you're going to take evens, of course, is that, you know, are we going to get to the stage with Shaquille where he starts starting even sl slower? Because as horses get older and get a little bit wiser, you do start to wonder how bad could this habit of starting slowly get? You know, could it could it slowly become him losing three lengths and then losing five lengths and then suddenly not coming out the stalls at all, for example. We've seen horses do that in the past. I'm not saying he's going to, but when you're taking even money 
a Bells that is a consistent perennial slow starter like Shaquille, uh, that certainly has to come into your, your your mind, I think. And that is really the only way he's going to get beat in the race. But it is a serious, serious prospect that he might blow it completely at the start and end up with too much of a mountain to climb. And that, for me, is a huge question mark at such a short price. But he's a worldie of a horse. He's an absolute superstar, isn't he? Yeah, he really is. There's a massive gap in the betting from, from favouritism at 10 to 11 to 11 to 1. Um, about the second favourite here. DJ, he is just a, an exceptional sprinter. And I guess that gap in the betting is just dependent on that start. Yeah, yeah. But look, he should win and uh, he probably will win. Uh, would you want to be back him before the race? I don't know you like put it this way like when you're back on a horse that short you don't want something like breaking to be against you like you want to know he's going to come out in terms you want to know he's going to settle there's a there's, there's a lot of question marks which he's answered but he's answered because of his ability and um, he keeps doing the same things he keeps missing the break and he keeps being keen but he keeps winning so he must have an incredible amount of ability to keep doing all this stuff and still win it. And, uh, yeah, he'll probably win again. And he'll probably do all the things wrong again and defy um, all those negatives. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I'd let him win. And I think he will win. But, like, Sacred is 12 to 1 each way. Oh, no. Lord, holy God, is Sacred not like a 13 to 2 shot here? Like, what on earth is Sacred doing a 12 to 1? Like, an absolute cork and run at Ascot. Like, where, you know... She basically won her side, and I know Cadem obviously came roughly on the same part of the track, but she won her race two out. Then she was she was ground down close home by by Cadem. She was still in front of Highfield Princess. She was still in front of Arturius. It was an absolute worldy of a run in terms of sacred. Um, I didn't think she ran too badly last time at all behind Kinross. It was a funny race. They split into two groups up the straight. She looked like she was a big threat to Kinross, maybe a furlong out, and then her run flattened out a bit. I just think in a strongly run six, which she's guaranteed to get here, in a strongly run six, she is a crack in each way play. There's no way she's going to go off 12 to 1. Not a hope in hell. I think she's a 13 to 2 shot. She mightn't win, but I find it very hard to see her finish there in the first three. Could get first four, could get first five places with some bookmakers. Surely she's going to be bang there. Is she not, Girod? Uh, well, if you fancy Sacred, then what's wrong with Cardem? You know, I mean, he did beat her fairly and squarely at um, at, at Royal Ascot, yeah, didn't he? Yeah, fluke, fluke. It only just happened. It's, I don't think Cardem. it was a fluke. I don't think it was, DJ. I mean, watch the race next time when he's behind Shaquille. He actually didn't run that badly, Card- Cardem. Obviously, no match for Shaquille. But that was on good to soft ground at Newmarket. And we, the one thing we know about Cardem is that he absolutely loves loves rattling fast ground. Uh, he, he he didn't get into the numfop last time over over five. He was, I think he finished seven. But again, he was nearest at the finish. We know how he's going to be ridden, don't we, Cardem? The, he's thirty three to one, I think. There's got to be a chance that Cardem could run into a place behind Shaquille if Shaquille wins. No. Ah, yeah. Look, you make a valid point, and it is. It does. It does seem ridiculous when you look at the Ascot race to think that Cardem is almost three times the price of a filly he beat like fair and square on the day like but I don't know I just think with Cad um, if you were giving me a match bet and I could back Sacred at one to two to finish ahead of Cad um, I would snap your hand your ears your eyes and your nose off because <laughs> I think Sacred will definitely finish okay. in front of Cad this time I'll tell you what though Carl Burke must be must be ruining his bad luck here must he because he must have been thinking all season, soft ground, haydock, sprint cup, early September, perfect for spy catcher. He's got a huge chance in that. We'll, we'll line it up for that race. And then what happens? You get the driest week of the whole year, probably, in, in September. And it looks like the ground's going to be, well, it's, it's good, isn't it? But you would you'd be surprised if it wasn't far side of good. So... I mean, I would have been a would have been a massive fan of Spycatcher if the ground had come up soft each way against Shaquille. But if it, if it's quick ground, I just think it'd be too quick for him. Yeah, Shaquille, look, he's definitely the one to beat, isn't he, as the favourite? But a good mention there for Sacred from DJ at twelve to one, and a small little mention for Cardim at thirty three to one as well from G Rod. So that's Leopardstown and Haydock all sewn up. Like I say, we're brought the the postcast is now brought to you by Racing Post Members Club, and if you want to get involved in Racing Post Members Club and the offers, check this out. Are you ready to take your passion for horse racing to the next level? 
With Racing Post Members Club, you gain exclusive access to the best racing insights, analysis and tools. Immerse yourself in award-winning content from interviews with the sport's biggest stars to race previews and behind-the-scenes features. Get the inside track with early access to the Racing Post digital newspaper from 9pm in the evening and daily selections from our expert tipsters. Racing Post Members Club is your ultimate ticket to the thrilling world of racing. Subscribe today and pay just £9.99 per month for the first two months with the code SUMMER. See the link in the video description for more information. Terms apply. Welcome back to the Racing Postcast brought to you by Racing Post Members Club. Yeah, look, £9.99 for your first two months. Use the code SUMMER. The link is in the description. We move on to the current now for the second day of the Irish Champions Weekend. It's the 2.25 where we start, which is the Moy Glare Jules Blanford Stakes, a group two over 10 furlongs for the Phillies and Mares. And above the curve, tops the market 10 to 11. Jackie O is 7 to 2. Lumiere Rock is 6 to 1. Araminta is 8 to 1, along with Never Ending Story and Trevor Nantes. And 11 to 1 and bigger about the rest. Not easy, this one, DJ, for the Sunday action. Obviously, we don't have full declarations at the time of recording. We have a rough idea who could end up going, though. So who do you like in this? Um, at the prices at the moment, if I knew she was going to run, I think Lumiere Rock is a big price for, for Joseph O'Brien. And uh, I, I, I don't know if Dylan Bray McMonagall is going to ride, but uh, Joseph has obviously got a birth above the curve, his anti-post favour. But I think with Lumiere Rock, like, she's just, she's just a smash in Philly that just keeps kind of doing her best and just keeps finding one too good. Uh, second to Caroline Street in, in a group three at Nays back in May, ran a cracker and it looks even better now behind Warm Heart in, in the Ribblesdale at Royal Alaska where she didn't get the clearest run. Then ran in the Irish Oaks, which watched him run to suit. Like she made the run in and I don't, I think she likes chasing the horses. Last time with Deauville, she was just touched off in a group two as well. We don't have the decks. We don't know if she's going to run against her stable mate, but uh, if she does, I think she's a rock solid each way play, Lumiere rock and, uh, I think that six to one will look a big price. Yeah, like I say, look, people who are listening can can take note of uh, the opinions on the race, and if these horses do turn up um, with the declarations, and you can look at the prices then, and um, probably wise in doing that. And the fact we don't know who exactly will be turning up, but G Rod, who did you like in this from a, a long term perspective? Yeah, I mean the the favourite above the curve is is a Group One filly isn't she now I'm just confused here because of course we do have group one and a half horses and then we have group one fillies now group one filly isn't always a group one horse and above the curve comes into that category isn't she? she's a group one filly but she's not a group one horse like put her in against the, the colts and that and she's probably a group two but this is nevertheless a fillies group two isn't it and she gets in here unpenalized uh as a group one winner so she should be too good for them and uh the horse that she finished third behind last time was uh Marquisa de Sevin or whatever that is uh that form uh is that again Gerard? was it Marquesa de Sevin something like that that's I'm exactly free. it yeah exactly right on the money. yeah right on money that's exactly it. So, um that horse went on and won didn't it a a good race I could, uh, what what race was it? You're gonna have to cutting edge analysis from G. Rod. Come here. Fr come here. Where's our French? Uh, where's our French man? Um, French connoisseur is presenting here. Yeah, there was there was a race that Marquez and won, and one of the horses in behind it came out and won next time, didn't it? I just can't remember what it was called now. Maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, I think that form's better than the rest. She's short favourite and should probably win. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna back her, am I? At, at odds on. Pre-Jean Romanet, wasn't it, Giro? Was that the one that, that she won? And it was the, the fifth that's come out and won a Group 2, I think, out in Germany. Is that Was that the one that you're referring to? Uh, I don't think so, but uh, maybe I've got it wrong. Oh, okay. But I, right. no, I just had it in my mind that this Marquise de Savine was quite good. Maybe yeah, she no. was good. She won. Oh, it was because she won next time, didn't she? Is that what happened? I think that's what happened, Sam. I think what actually happened, right, sorry, just pretend that that didn't happen. I think what happened is that she came out and won next time a group one, didn't she? Marquise de Seville. Yeah, she, she won the, the Prix-Jean Romanet and she beat above the curve in that Prix-Jean Romanet at Deauville uh, a couple of weeks back. All right, well, forget that then. I, I'm talking nonsense, obviously. But anyway, I think that... <laughs> Unbelievable, Jeff. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh right, okay. So, so the selection in the race for you is Gerard. I think the Fab will win uh, above the curve. Group one, Philly in a group two, Philly's race. Fine, okay, right above the curve for Gerard. Let's move on then to the two fifty-five, which is the Albasti Equiworld Dubai Flying Five Stakes, a Group One over five furlongs. Where Highfield Princess is the thirteen to eight favourite. Brad Sell three to one. Art Power just loves the car, doesn't he? Five to one, and a big jump sixteen to one to the French Raider Boudmont, and twenty to one and bigger about the rest of them. Gerard, two top quality sprinters, Brad Sell and Highfield Princess at the top of the market. But Art Power, I'm not saying he's not top quality, but he's a danger just due to the fact that he absolutely loves the Curra, doesn't he? Yeah, he's unbeatable, isn't he, at the Curra at the moment. I mean, the, the amount of um, races that he's won, I think he's won four in a row. He's, he's, he's won them all by three or four lengths each time and nothing can touch him there. And he, he of course, won over five furlongs there last time. Now, it's a little bit different, I suppose, coming up against horses like... Highfield Princess and Brad Sell because they're proper speedy five furlong group one horses, aren't they? And the horses that Art Power beat at Dakara last time over five furlongs were only sort of group two, group three quality sprinters. So it's a little bit different, but uh, I thought the price was was fair enough on Art Power considering his record at the Curra is so ridiculously good. And um, it was a weird race, wasn't it, the Nunthorpe, where Highfield Princess and Brad Sell both got beaten by the the, the, the great story of the week, wasn't it, living the dream for um, Adam West. And um, I just half wonder whether maybe they, they thought that living the dream was coming back <laughs> and they were going to pick up the pieces. And as it was, living the dream was just so fast, they didn't see which way he went. Um, nevertheless, I... Uh, I was a bit disappointed with both of them and uh, having seen them both coming off the back of defeats and of course Art Power didn't run badly away from the Curra last time did he? He ran in the group one in Deauville uh, what they call it De Geest is it? The Murray's De Geest and he, you know, he finished fifth and he was only beaten a couple of lengths so back at his old favourite stomping ground more than happy to back uh, Art Power Oh, wow. Yeah, you got that one spot on, Gerard. The pre Maurice de Geese, that was, yeah, uh, ran well. Yeah, these, that... these French form really tested me here, Sam. You know, like, I struggle to keep on top of the British form as it is, you know, let alone all these French races coming in. But I suppose that's what it's going to be like because we've got the Arc coming up soon, don't we? We have, yeah. And not, I think, three weeks away, four weeks away into the Arc. But, yeah, the, the French races, I think. People who know me will know how much I love the French racing. So I do follow these group group races out there and listed races um, all the time. So I know a bit about the French form. DJ Art Power, look, there's something about him that just absolutely loves the Curra. Is he worth taking on? Is he a danger to take on? Yeah, like he's four from four at the Curra, and the best performance of his career only came, whatever, a couple of weeks ago. He recorded a racing pulse rating of 120. Um, there's just something that's in my head, and I think every time he's come to Ireland, he's four from four to Curry, he's one from one at Nays, he's five from five in Ireland. I just wonder potentially does he need a bit of cut in the ground just to be at his best, especially over five rattling quick ground, five furlongs. He's not going to get away from them. I don't. He can't get away from these. So that'd be my worry about our power um, here. Look, if he won, you'd just say, oh God, sure he's a Curry specialist. But these sprinters wreck my head because. I always feel like you, you see in the Nuntorp it was it was um, you know Highfield Princess Bradsell and you kind of always knew that potentially there was something some fly in the ointment and it proved to be living the dream which I couldn't have predicted before the race and that maybe there is here too you know maybe there is there's probably something just kind of lurking that's going to catch them out I don't know what it is but I think the bet is Bradsell. Uh, I just watched the Nuntorp a couple of times. So I was I was on a couple of days holiday in Italy during the York meeting, and I watched back the replays afterwards. And I'd only watched the Nuntorp once before today, and I watched you know twice this morning. And I just think there's too much of a difference in the price between Bradsell and Highfield Princess because we probably know now they're much of a muchness given Bradsell beat uh, Highfield Princess at Ascot in the King Stand and then obviously uh, Highfield Princess was just, just ahead of Bradsell last time in the Nuntorp but I, I just have a feeling the King Stand is going to be more like this flying five this time and uh, I think the Curras I think the Curra could suit Bradsell don't don't read too much into the fact that the Curra that his soul started the Curra Bradsell he bombed out he got injured that day behind Little Big Bear in the Phoenix last year and um, 
take that run away and the one run behind little big bear at Haydock um, and he's he's still a progressive sprinter he's only had the seven starts and I think at the prices he's value against uh, Highfield Princess so it is Brad sell for me but I won't be one bit surprised if something like living the dream pops up at 33 to 1 and beats them both <laughs> okay Brad sell 3 to 1 uh, taking on Highfield Princess in the flying 5 DJ and Art Power the Curra specialist for G Rod. Let's move on to the first of two really good two year old races that we've got on Sunday at the car. It's the 325, which is the Moigles Stud Stakes over seven furlongs. This for the Phillies, Group 1, where Ylang Ylang is the even money favourite. Vespa Tilio, 6 to 1. Porta Fortuna, 7 to 1. 8 to 1 about the Carl Burke Horse, Fallen Angel, also 8 to 1 about Red Viburnum, and 10 to 1 and bigger. The rest of them in here. DJ, this is the first of what could end up being a uh, a good two-year-old double for Aidan O'Brien with, with City of Troy coming up in the national stakes. Ylang Ylang, what do we make of her? I'd say she's she's good. Uh, would, would you back her as, as evens or slightly odds on to win this race? I don't know. I think there's there's potentially two very good fillies running against her. Uh, Verse Pertilio, who was second to Ylang Ylang at Leperstown last time, or two starts ago, or Ylang Ylang's last start in the, in the Silver Flash, I'd say is is a very good filly. I'd say she's a smasher. She absolutely bolted up in the debut on stakes. And the way she travelled all over them, I was like, whoa, what the hell is this? And um, she got a racing post rating of 103 for that. It was a hell of a performance. I'd say she's very good. I'd say she's improved again. Ylang Ylang hasn't ran since. I'd say if the first filio, first pertilio we saw at... The current last time, you know, cracking each way play at six to one. Uh, we'll give a shout out to Red uh, Verburnum. I spoke to Dermot Weld earlier on this week. He won this race last year with Tahira, who had only had the one start, although she had won at Galway. Red Verburnum had ran at the Curra in a maiden, probably should have won, flew home, real eye catcher, works well. Dermot was very sweet on her. I know Chris Hayes is very sweet on her too. So there's two real big dangers to Ylang Ylang in Verse Bertilio and Red Verburnum. And, I think if you back both potentially each way at six to one and seven to one, I think you'll be making a nice tidy profit. Uh, Vespa Tilio currently six to one and Red Viburn eight to one for DJ. Then the Moyglare Stud Stakes. G Rod, what about yourself in here? I don't know these fillies that well, Sam. If I'm honest with you, um, I've not seen a lot of Yelang Yelang. Why you would call a horse that? I've got absolutely no idea. Uh, horrible name, isn't it? Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, she she obviously won well, beating Vespa Tilio, whatever the thing's called. Uh, opera singer, I thought was very impressive when she won at, at the Curra last time, and is quite a big price. But it's difficult to know without knowing what uh, what Aiden's actually going to run. And uh, you presume that if the Elaine Elaine runs, then uh, Ryan will probably choose her. Um, and we'll see who, who gets booked up to ride Opera Singer if she gets declared uh, at a later date. But it's not a, a race that I would have a strong view on, Sam. No, no. You know what your Lang Lang is? It's a flower, is it not? Yeah, it's like a tree or a plant. It's like it apparently it eases that the oil from it like eases stress and tension and anxiety and helps you yeah. sleep and stuff so it, we can I've all be doing it. with a bit of your lang your lang i've seen it yeah. in the health uh, health health shops i've seen your lang your lang i think yeah it's an oil that, that you can get that's that's very beneficial for your health so there you go that is the actual meaning let's move on then to the four o'clock shall we which is the goffs vincent o'brien national states again over seven furlong group one this time for the two-year-old Colts and city of troy is the four to seven favorite buccanero fuerte is 11 to four then we have a huge jump up to 16 to 1 about Diego Velasquez and Henry Longfellow. Probably both of these won't be running. 25 to 1 about formal display. Again, probably not going to end up here. It's probably worth just focusing on the top of the market, isn't it, G Rod? City of Troy and Buccanero Fuerte. You've got the one that has huge potential in City of Troy after that superlative performance. And the one that's a little bit more exposed is Buccanero Fuerte, who won the Phoenix in really good style the last day. Who do you like here? Yeah, uh, it's. It's too short a favourite for me here, City of Troy. It was obviously very good when winning at Newmarket, but the Ulster um, he beat Hartem was very disappointing next time up at York. Uh, I thought it was a very, very weak race uh, that he won. Uh, and wrong, 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 wrong. What, you wrong, think that's wrong. a good race? No, he, 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 he wasn't very disappointing next up at... Uh, he wasn't very disappointing next up at York. He won next time at Goodwood. Oh, Hartem? Hartem, yeah. 
He won, oh, the, yeah. well, he won he them in the stakes and then disappointed at York a little bit, didn't he? Sorry, he ran poorly at York, didn't he? You know, he won um, the vintage, so. Yeah, the vintage is always a rubbish race, isn't it? Every year. <laughs> It, 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 in all fairness, it wasn't the strongest race. I have to say that. He has won the Group 2 Vintage, but it wasn't the strongest race. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, you, you can be the adjudicate here. Yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, he won by, what, miles, didn't he? Six and a half lengths. But it was um, at Newmarket's July course, and I'm always banging on about the fact that um, you just nine times out of ten have to race prominently there, and... He did race prominently, and I do think that he was well suited by the way the race sort of panned out for him. Don't get me wrong. Obviously, I'm trying to pick at straws a little bit because he's won so easily, but he's at such a short price on the back of one real outstanding performance that I couldn't be backing him uh, in this race at that price. The question is, Sam, what's going to beat him? isn't it? Like you say, Bucanero Fuerte. It's the only one, really, isn't it, that, that could beat him, if you look at it. Like, you'd be shocked if anything else would have come out and beat him. You would be, wouldn't you? Yeah, and 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 there's not much between the two of them on RPRs, is there? You're looking at a, a pound between the two. I think... Um, I'm trying to think who does their Irish RPRs. Or is it Johnny Pearson, is it? So, Johnny Pearson, yeah. Yeah, so he's he's uh, he's only got him one pound behind Buccaneero Fuerte. Um, anyway, the thing to take out of it is that I think the favourite's too short, and I don't know what's going to beat him. Yeah, no, like I say, look, the City of Troy. A lot have got overexcited. I think on Twitter, yes, he's very excited. And yes, he could be a superstar. But I think if one firm went around five to two for the the two thousand guineas, which I just think's far too short. I think we've got a bit too overexcited oh. there. Go on, Gerard. He doesn't train sort of superstar horses that win by miles, does he, Aidan O'Brien? Now, don't get me wrong, he trains a lot of Group 1 winners and, and, and whatever. But if you look down the years at Aidan O'Brien's great horses, uh, most of them are rather sort of unflashy types who, who get the job done without looking anything special, don't they? Look at even Paddington this year. I know he looked good at Ascot, but... You know, just gets the job done. Giants Causeway. Uh, you know, I, I, there's not. For example, I know that I'm putting it out there a little bit, but the, he hasn't trained a, a Frankel, has he, or anything that's that's that, that, that absolutely blasts everything in their wake by a mile. Um, and given the amount of Group One as winners that he's had, and the amount of great horses that he's had through his hands, Aidan O'Brien, I would still argue that he's He's still yet to have that absolutely amazing horse in the same bracket as a Frank or a Bayou. Uh, yeah, yeah. DJ, I, I just want to I'll let you lead in on this one. You, you can give your opinion on the race. But what do you make of this? Of Rodgers' point or yeah, the race? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, look, you, you can't. Like, that's like saying, you know, Sam is presenting there today. Like, it's like saying, oh, you know, Sam is a very good presenter, but like, He's not Michael Parkinson. Like you can't, <laughs> like you can't, you can't gauge horses against Frank. Frank is the best we'll ever see. Michael Parkinson is the best presenter we'll ever see. You can't just go, oh well, he hasn't trained a Frankel. There's only one person who has trained a Frankel, and that's Henry Sesson. So you can't say he's never trained a Frankel because he's never trained a Frankel. So no, he's never trained a horse that's. But really like you can name, okay, right, right. Hawkwing in the Lockinge, one by a mile, unbelievable. Rock of Gibraltar in his three-year-old season, unbelievable. Galileo, when you know when Galileo was on song in the Derby, was incredible, like absolutely incredible performance. Like he's he has trained exceptional racehorses who who win by a lot. Obviously, in recent years, you're looking at maybe you know. I don't know if you're thinking of this year, maybe in Paddington and looking back, like a lot of his three-year-olds probably in, like you look at Camelot, like if Camelot had have won the St. Ledger and wasn't beaten by the infamous Godolphin horse, he would have went down as one of the best horse of all time, an unbeaten triple crown winner. Instead, he was wrongly beaten in the St. Ledger at Doncaster and then he they furthered his career and he was beaten twice afterwards or whatever. But like, he has trained exceptional racehorses like do you know what I mean he hasn't trained a Frankel yeah, yeah, I'll give you that I'll give you, I'll give you those actually because the Hawkwing did really get me excited and, and Galileo did also but I'm just thinking maybe in the last 10 years since the sort of Galileo 
um, period came along where he was a stallion, of course, not when he was very winning. Sort of that, I, I, I have this sort of notion of them all being clones of one of each other. They all look yeah, but the that's, same. That's, they all race in a similar manner. They're all very, don't get me wrong, don't take nothing away. They're all very talented and they're very gutsy and they, they, they really put their head down and battle and they get the job done. But none of them really got me excited. And I suppose people are looking at this city of Troy here and they're thinking, this all is, it's got the potential to be like, not Frankel, but the most exciting horse that Aidan O'Brien's trained for years. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a, I, I think personally, I think this is a, this is a good price. Um, I don't think four to seven is a bad price at all, and wow. I think he could. I think he could go off one to three. Uh, it looks a match on paper, and the thing about it is, when you go through this field, we're we're it's now nearly half four, but we started this at half three on Thursday. The decks are not in. This could be a very small field. Like um, Deep One is run on Saturday. Diego Velasquez is run on Saturday. Formal display is only a maiden. I'm not sure he's going to run. Henry Longfellow is not going to run. He's going to the Dewhurst. Will he run Johan Brahms and Mountain Bear? I don't think so. Jerry Lines has got Tamrat in there. I don't know if he'll run him. So you could have four runners. You could have four runners. And for that reason, at the moment, if people are listening, I have no idea if this horse is going to run or not now. But if you are looking for a sneaky each way before the decks come out, Ireland's in the stream, who was second to Henry Longfellow last time, um, potentially could be the play here. Because if he does run... You might only have to get him into the first three, and he might only have to beat one or two horses actually to to get your place money. Um, he's a good horse, and uh, I think uh, I think he could finish third to City of Troy and Bucanero uh, Fuerte. Um, as regards the top two in the market, the ratings have Bucanero Fuerte a pound above City of Troy. I personally think City of Troy is the real deal. I love how much he finds off the bridle. I love his style of racing. I love the way he's so relaxed. I love the distance he put between himself and Hatem at the line in, in the superlative. Um, I, I think Aiden has four absolute cork, and I said it earlier in the show, cork and two-year-olds. I think this is probably Henry Longfellow and City of Troy, to me, are the top two, and then you've got Diego Velasquez and River Tiber. I'll be, I'll be astonished if Bucanero Forte is, is better than City of Troy. So I think, I think this could be the performance of the weekend. Okay, City of Troy, yeah, like four to seven at the moment. May not be the best, worst price in the world, according to DJ. But Ireland's in the stream. Currently 12 to one with Firm's anti-poster offering three places, 25s or bigger with those offering two places. So if you were to take the advice in the anti post markets there, then you could do, um, depending on whether you want the two places or three places. Let's move on to the final race we're going to be covering on the postcard with the 435 at the car, which is... The uh, Irish St. Ledger, one mile, six furlongs for this Group 1 contest, where we see the return of Kiprios, uh, 5 to 2. Hamish is 130. Eldar Eldorf is 4 to 1. Emily Dickinson is 4 to 1. Dawn Rising and Yashin, 20 to 1. And 25 to 1 about Broom and Valiant King. Um, DJ, you go first here. I suppose we, we just have to talk about Kiprios as the leading question here. He makes his return. Aidan said, look, he doesn't expect him, obviously, to be at his, his full best after having that that setback and being off for so long. But, you know, if he does put in a big display here, he's, he's sure to be in for a massive autumn campaign. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I just... From Chatton Hayden all season, I think that the gist of it is we want to get him back. We want to run him once or twice in the autumn so we're going to have the horse to win everything next year. I think the plan is to keep him in training as a six-year-old and just wipe the floor. If he didn't have this... Looking at, you know, some of the nonsense that's going on in the staying division this year, you'd imagine he would have absolutely wiped the floor with the whole lot of them. Um, uh, it's interesting. I don't think Emily Dickinson is going to run. Um, you know, she she's better with cutting the ground. It's going to be so quick. They're watering all week at the Curra. Um, and if she doesn't run, um, Hamish obviously wants cutting the ground. Are they going to run Hamish on rattling quick grounds? I don't know. Uh, so I would say Kiprios if they think put it this way if they think the real Kiprios or even 90% of the real Kiprios is going to run Emily Dickinson I don't think will run and I think they think they're going to win it because you might just have Eldar Alderov Don Rising Broom Yashin I think will run a big race he was I thought really unlucky in the Ebor he's not near good enough to win a classic or a classic for older horses but um, 
I could see him running a massive race and what again could be a small field. I'm completely only guessing here because we're filming this on Thursday, but uh, I think it's a race you have to sit and watch, hope Kiprios wins, and if he does win nicely, it's going to be tremendously exciting for the rest of the campaign. Could they possibly even run him in the arc? Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Um, I'm going to be putting my nap up later on in this race, but I'll have to wait to reveal who that's going to be. Um, G-Rod, who do you like? And in it's the not Irish Kiprios. Or... It's not going to be as much as I do want him to win, but I will sure, reveal. It's obviously Eldar Just, we'll, we'll wait, we'll wait. G-Rod, who do you like in the Irish St. Ledger? Uh, it, it's, it, it's an interesting race because Kiprios is running, isn't it, um, Sam? You know, great to see him back. Um, and he was obviously outstanding towards the end of last season I, I i actually didn't rate his 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 royal his royal ascot win last year much uh, any higher than, than this year's gold cup winner uh, courage mon ami but uh i did think that he had uh, the potential to go on and, and and better that figure and of course he did go and do it with that ridiculous win at longshore when he hung all over the track and still won by 20 lengths uh, if that horse turns up, then they might as well stay at home, mightn't they? But um, you've got to wonder whether that horse is going to turn up after 344 days off and, and, and obviously not everything's gone to plan with him this year. Uh, uh, and um, also, is he? I know he goes on fast ground, but is he a better horse on soft ground? He looked so good at a long shot, didn't he? So um, there's a few there's a few question marks there. Hamish and Emily Dickinson definitely want soft ground. So uh, the only horse you could entertain backing against Kiprios is, is Elder Eldorov. Um, and I think he's been mightily disappointing this season so far. Um, he, he opened up the season with what I thought was an excellent run um, to finish behind um, Gia Velotto uh, when he was giving him way. And I thought, well, this horse is going to win everything. And then he just drifted like a barge someone knew someone somewhere knew that that he wasn't right for for the gold cup at royal ascot he ended up going off six to one but he was 100 to 30 in the morning uh favorite for the race and then last time out maybe it was just a right we'll try and get him back on track and 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 get him back uh, to something like his best form and he it was in that funny race wasn't it where quick thorn went off and broke them uh, which we obviously hoped he was going to do to kiprios last year but when he is good, quick for and he is very, very good, and he was very, very good that day, despite obviously getting an easy lead. But it was a funny old race, and Elder Elder, I thought, was given a, a considerate ride to come through and finish uh, on the heels of the leaders, almost as though, right, well, we'll get him back, and we'll get him back rolling. And I think they're trying to get him back rolling for this race. He goes on fast ground, and he's the only horse who you, you could realistically see beating Kiprios. And I'd rather back him... Knowing that he's hard fit and Kiprios coming off such a long absence. He is absolutely Sam's nap. No mm-hmm. doubt about it in the world. Look at him trying to contain that excitement. Yeah, well, look, that's that's all the big race previews that we're covering on the postcast. Join us shortly after this where we'll get the gents bets elsewhere as well as our naps for the weekend. Do you want over £500 in free bets? Well, the best free bet offers are now all in one place. Head to racingpost.com forward slash free bets where you can find all the offers from your favourite bookmakers. Click the link in the description to find out more. Welcome back to the final part of the Racing Postcast brought to you by Racing Post Members Club. Our final part, our shortest part of the show, but we do go and get the gents' bets elsewhere. There's plenty of good action all over both UK, Ireland and even over in France as well this weekend. So let's start with DJ. What else have you got away from the action that we've covered this weekend? Uh, I'm going to give you two at uh, Leprosin, if that's all right. And my nap is actually running at Haydock and not the race we previewed. Yeah. So, And I'm very sweet on it. Uh, so uh, two in the clo- in first race at uh, Leprosin on Saturday, the 145. It's a rematch between Contents and Apricot Ice. Uh, from their maiden uh, earlier on the season, 16 days ago. I thought content was nicely on top of the line, and I think content will frank that form. It's a good race, though. Kitty Rose looked very good first time out, but I thought content uh, would win that for Aidan O'Brien and Ryan Moore. And then later on the card, in the speaking of Aidan O'Brien, the 540, the Sovereign Path Handicap, I just wonder, is this Broadhurst chucked in off America 93? Um, Look, we haven't seen him since uh, since he ran at Nace in May. 
sent off 7-4 favourite that day. Ryan Moore has had an exceptional season. This was probably one of his worst rides of the season. Didn't quite get up to beat Fort Vega. Um, runs off the same mark here in 93. Cheek pieces on for the first time. I would say this is a undoubtedly a three-figure horse running off a two-figure rating here off 93. Uh, so Broadhurst, I thought, would win that 540. And uh, one at a, a potentially bigger price in the 505, I thought Edna Rosso uh, was reasonably interesting in his first handicap off of Mark in 99. I don't think we've seen the best of him yet. I think he could go very well for Joseph O'Brien and Dylan Bray McMonagall. But my strongest fancy anywhere on Saturday or Sunday runs at Haydock on Saturday. And I'll be telling you that when we're revealing their naps. Okay, so Edna Rosso in the 505, and then Aidan O'Brien and Ryan Moore to bookend the card at Leppistown on Saturday with content in the 145 and Broadhurst in the 540 there. G Rod, what else have you got for us elsewhere? I only got one for you, Sam. In the 235 at Ascot, bless him, uh, is really, really well handicapped on his best form, uh, and he Bounced right back when he was fourth behind Biggles in the one of those big handicaps at the July course. Was it the Bunbury Cup, I think? Yeah, got that right. Good. Um, that was on uh, soft ground, good soft ground, but he definitely wants quick ground, bless him. Um, and last time out, he was running over the course and distance, and he didn't run too badly. Again, probably on ground that was a bit slower than he likes. He gets in off top weight. Hayley Turner is riding. Um, obviously, with Jamie Spencer riding um, Cardem over at Haydock. Um, he does need a proper weighting ride, bless him. But not many people ride uh, Ascot straight track better than um, Hayley. So I think that's a positive for him. And he should get his ground because it's absolutely glorious weather, isn't it, outside? There's yeah, Ascot 235 on Saturday. Bless him, Hayley Turner taking the ride. Top weight in the handicap there. Now it's time for the best bets of the weekend. I suppose I should now kick things off um, due to the fact that G. Uh, sorry, it's G- Eldar Eldorov. Yes, it is. It is Eldar Eldorov. I think Oi. that, look, look, the, the horse was uh, obviously second at York on seasonal reappearance this season. Finished ahead of, of Quick Fawn and Broom. Uh, I don't mean that's the worst form in the world, but look at this horse's form over a mile and six furlongs. Like Prior to that, he's only ever run over that distance twice. Once in the Queen's Vars, which he won, and then went on to win the St. Ledger. I do feel, I, I just don't know whether this horse actually stays two miles or two mile four properly. I think this horse is a one mile six furlong specialist. I can see him putting a massive run in. I love Kiprios. I'd love to see him come back to full form, obviously, but I just think Elder Elder off match fit, like G-Rod said, I think 4-1 to one at the moment might not be the worst price in the world about him. G-Rod, I'll go to you first about your nap. Who's that going to be? Yeah, I'm, I'm very confident about Nashua in the 320 at Leopardstown on, on Saturday. I think she will definitely be in the first three. And I think they've all got to improve to beat her. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to nap her. Seven to one, fifteen to two looks massive to me. Okay, Nashua in the Irish Champion Stakes at Leopardstown on Saturday, which is the three twenty. And DJ, who's your nap this weekend? That comes from Haydock. It does. The three o'clock, the Betfair Exchange Old Borough Cup. Uh, it's a horse I've spoken about on the postcast a couple of times before, but oh, I am so sweet in this horse, Sam. Post impressionist. Form figures of zero nine seven nine. Would you believe? Uh, for post impressionists, but just go back and have a look at the Ebor again. Post impressionists, the post impressionists that I fell in love with last season is back, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, he is back. Uh, Travelled beautifully under Adam Farahar throughout. Uh, I'd say he was probably last off the bridle, then kind of got his ground taken off him at a crucial stage down the middle of the track, kind of um, when Sweet William was making his move. And I just, I just wanted to see a glimpse. I just wanted to see a glimpse that the horse that I thought was one of the best handicap players going into the season is finally coming back. There have been glimpses. I thought in Chirgar Cup Day, there was a small little bit. Then I thought it was very interesting to run him a fortnight later in, in the Ebor, and now he's out a fortnight again. He's running him back to back to back very quickly, and he's running off America 93. If the real post impressionist shows up, he will eat this lot. Uh, I think Haydock is perfect for him. Ran an absolute cracker at Haydock last season. Um, 
when he was the moral winner of a of a handicap over this trip. Um, you know, he just was absolutely crucified in the closing stages. I think uh, what won a double cherry. I think one it. it was the big Stewart's inquiry. Um, but to me, this horse is just ready to have a proper autumn campaign. Was dying to see whether William Haggis would send him out quickly after the Ebor and run him in this very race. Everything is in his favour. He was eight to one a couple of minutes, a couple of minutes, a couple of hours ago. He's seven to one now. I still think that seven to one is a big price. If the real post impressionist shows up, I'd be disappointed if he's beat. Okay, post impressionist seven to one in the three o'clock at Haydock on Saturday, and that's it for this racing postcast. A really busy racing postcast with so much racing to cover. Usually, we'll only cover sort of six or seven races, so it's a lot more speedy. But we wanted to get through all of the top class action this weekend. Big thanks to David Jennings and Graham Robway. As always, remember if you are having a bet this weekend to gamble responsibly. If you're watching on YouTube, do like, comment, subscribe, get involved. And if you're listening on all platforms, we wish you the best of weekends as well. Until then, thanks for listening and we'll uh, see you again for another racing postcast.